The power of his presence. That's my message this morning. The power of his presence. Heavenly Father, we're not going to behold you then. We're going to behold you now. Not in some distant time, but beholding your presence now. Manifest yourself in our midst today. You promised to manifest your presence. Give us a taste of that, the awesomeness of it, the glory of it, the power of your presence. Amen. And all the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. Ezekiel 38, 20. All the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence, and the mountains shall be thrown down, and the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. There's a very ominous scripture in the Bible that brings a lot of comfort to some Christians, and it's, it's this, Matthew 7, 22. Now, please, don't follow me. I'm going to be going through so many scriptures you can't. Just put your Bible down. It's all there, I tell you. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name we've cast out devils. In thy name we've done mighty, wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now that comforts the majority of Christians. Have you ever heard a Christian who believed that applied to them? It, it's often, well, that can't be me. I've never prophesied. I've never cast out devils. I've not done these great works. I've never met a Christian who believed that applied to them. But let me give you a warning from the Holy Spirit this morning. It does apply to everybody in this place now. It has to do with everybody who has eaten the bread of life, who has tasted of the living water, everyone who's had communion. If you've ever taken communion, here Luke 13, 25, when once the master of the house has risen up and he has shut the door, and you begin to stand without, and you begin to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us, and he shall answer and say to you, I don't even know whence you are. Then shall you begin to say, But we've eaten and drunk in your presence, and you have taught amongst us. And he shall say, I tell you, I know you not at all. Depart from me, ye work of iniquity. You may be able to slouch off the first, but you can't put off this warning, because these are those among the well-fed, those who have been well-taught, who ate the spiritual bread and drank the spiritual drink in the very presence of Christ. Those who've had communion, in other words. Those who are to be called by his name. Those who are in the house. It's possible to feast on the word of God, to drink his living water, to hear revelation truth, and still not even enter into the power of his presence. If you go to the book of Ruth, you see Ruth, who is a type of the believer. And you see her... Uh, leaving all, forsaking everything, a type of being born again, and you see her tasting of the first fruits, that's being filled with the Holy Spirit. She still hasn't met Boaz, the type of Christ. You go into the second chapter. She's saved and filled with the Holy Ghost and type, yet she's never even been in the power of His presence. She's not even met Boaz yet. You say, is that possible? Yes, I know a lot of Christians saved and filled with the Holy Spirit who have never really known anything about the power of His awesome presence. Now, what was their iniquity? Because Jesus did call them workers of iniquity. The iniquity of these who have been eating and drinking in his presence, heard this revelation, knowledge, and truth, is that they did not tremble in his presence. They did not tremble in his holy presence. The devils trembled, but they did not. The earth shook and the hills melted like wax. The walls were crumbling in his presence, but they stood in his presence, frivolous, unbending, unbroken, refusing to be melted or smitten or convicted. David the psalmist said, Why not tremble, O earth, at the presence of your God? When Israel lost the fear of God, and when they no longer trembled in the presence of the Lord, they became brazen, they became light and surface, they became wicked, and their preachers became bags of wind. That's what the Scripture said, Israel has dealt treacherously against me, saith the Lord. They say evil shall not come upon us. We will not suffer. We will not have sword or famine. And the prophets shall become wind. And the word is not in them. They have a rebellious spirit. As the cage is full of birds, so are their houses full of deceit. Therefore they become successful and they've grown rich. They are waxen rich and they overlook the deeds of the wicked. They don't care for the poor anymore, the fathers, yet they continue to prosper. The prophets are lying, and my people love to have it that way. Isn't that tragic? And the Lord goes on, 
in the next verse and says, Will you not fear me? Why will you not tremble in my presence? Their hearts were so fixed on prosperity, they didn't even acknowledge his presence finally. So I'm not going to rail against God's people. I don't believe in that. But I'm going to make some comments on the flippancy I see in Pentecostal charismatic meetings today, in conventions and conferences and in churches. Where is the awe, the majesty, the trembling in his holy presence anymore? Why do we call the almighty God of this universe Daddy? Why do we come into his exalted presence with our filthy rags of flesh, applauding him instead of falling on our face? Do you know how many times you people applauded this morning? You applauded when they sang, you applauded when I got up, and I'm not railing on you, I'm not spanking anybody. But if we were really in the awesome presence of God, there wouldn't be anybody clapping their hands except for his glory. When Isaiah came into his presence, he was humbled and smitten. Smitten when the Lord's glory filled the temple, even the seraphims covered their face with two of their wings. They cried out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The posts of the door were moved at the sound of his voice. Isaiah cupped his face in his hands and he cried out, Woe is me, I'm undone, I'm unclean. All God's people are unclean. Now, what does that say to you when a holy man of God, a holy prophet, comes into the brilliant presence of the Lord and he has to confess his sins. And a voice that shook the earth and they trembled. This wasn't daddy standing in front of them. These weren't king's kids asking for blessings. The Bible said, but a great quaking fell upon us all and we fell to the ground. Daniel's knees buckled. He said, there remaineth no strength in me. My vigor was turned to corruption. I retained no strength. My face was toward the dust. I fell down in his presence. Does that say something to you and me? When a beloved man of God, a holy man like Daniel, sees the flaming eyes of God and can't even stand up or hold his head up? How different today. There was a charismatic meeting recently and a woman preached of... I mean, she preached a masterful sermon, and they gave her a five-minute standing ovation. If it had been from the throne of God, everybody in that place would have been on their face repenting and seeing their sins as Isaiah and Daniel did. Shouldn't we as an audience be on our face when His presence appears? Should we be judging sin in our life? Shouldn't our self-righteousness drain out of us? Where do you find meetings today where people quake in the presence of the Lord and cup their hands in their face and say, Woe is me. I've been living in adult. I've been living in sin. I've been compromising. I'm not truly devoted to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we're to come into his courts with praise and thanksgiving, but not frivolously or presumptuously. Let me tell you what a wicked king by the name of Darius said. And he said more than many charismatic prophets and preachers have ever said. And this is an ungodly king who's just seen a demonstration of God shutting the mouths of lions. And he says it to all of us. Here's, here, was, was, here was his warning. All that dwell on the earth and every dominion in my kingdom tremble and fear before the God of Daniel because he's a living God and he has dominion. I'm asking everybody in my kingdom to tremble in his presence. A wicked king. We don't tremble out of fear. We tremble at the awesome power that's at our disposal. We tremble at His awesome holiness. Not because it's arrayed against us, but before us on our behalf. Not to bring fear, but to bring the awe of glory. Do you know that the child of God who really knows the Lord, if you've really been in His presence, you become less concerned about your rights and your blessings, and you become more enthralled with His presence, the casualness will give way to a dignity. You know, there was a time you couldn't come into a truly spiritual service, and people whispering there was an awe, there was a hush, and people came because they'd been locked in His presence through the day, and they came in, not gossiping, they came there, sat there in the presence of the Lord. It was awesome. It was holy. There was dignity. I'm so sick and tired of the lightness and the frivolity and the shallowness. Informality gives way to reverence and a holy esteem. There have been times I've been in the presence of the Lord. I passed out once in a, a meeting, and I was in the third heaven. 
And I saw his glory, didn't see his face, but I was in his actual presence and in his glory for half an hour. And when I came out, my wife couldn't talk to me. Nobody dared talk to me. There was an aura. There was a sense of his presence. Nobody dared tell a joke in my presence because I had the glory of his presence. And if I'm just his servant and I had a touch of it, what's it like when his actual presence appears? Will there be any joking? Will there be any applauding? No! Our meetings have become like entertainment centers. I'm so sick of it. I don't allow any clapping. In, I don't allow any plotting doing my preaching anywhere I go. God's about to do something new, folks. The charismatic renewal is not the last outpouring before Jesus comes. It's the Feast of Tabernacles, and that's a holy manifestation of the actual presence of Jesus dealing with sin and iniquity and bring us into the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. A new bread of men who have been in His presence. I want to make a few statements concerning the awesome power of His presence. First of all, God's people are becoming powerless because they're getting away from the power of His presence, becoming very weak. Let's look at Jonah for an example. Here's a prophet of God. Jonah really enjoyed the presence of the Lord. He had been given a vision of the prosperity of Israel, that God was going to restore Israel. And he loved that kind of revelation, knowledge. He loved being in the presence of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Jonah must have really been close to the Lord or he could not have possibly heard such clear direction as he received. Arise, go to Nineveh and preach to that great wicked city. No man gets that clear direction unless he's been in his awesome presence. Nobody gets that clear direction unless he really knows the Lord. It had been an exciting, up to this time it had been an exciting experience. Oh, he could go around, God is wonderful. He could sing and shout in the presence of the king because there'd been no demands made on him yet. It comes a time the presence of the Lord makes a demand on you. There was a personal demand being made, rise up and preach against sin. He was to go and threaten a whole society. He was supposed to go and preach hellfire and brimstone to a whole society. But Jonah rose up to flee to Tarsus from the presence of the Lord. If the Lord had told him to go preach prosperity to Israel, he would have obeyed. If the Lord had told him to go to preach to the kings of Israel and tell them the great restoration is coming, he would have gone. But Lord, I am not going to go preach hell, for I'm not going to denounce sin, I'm not going to threaten anybody with divine judgment, and especially not to such a corrupt society as Nineveh. He refused the call. Now, you remember who he's refusing now. He's refusing him whose train has filled the temple. From him whose face is as lightning, his eyes as flame of fire. And his arm is a polished brass. He's running from him whose very gaze buckles your knee. He's not running from anybody else. He's running from the presence of Almighty God. Why does a man flee from the presence of the Lord? You think Jonah was afraid of the Ninevites? No. Was he too proud? Was he stubborn? No. If you want to know why Jonah ran away from Nineveh toward Tarsus, take a look inside your own heart. You don't have to look very far. He was afraid of the sin in his own life. You can't be bold as a lion when there's corruption inside because only the pure are bold as a lion. That, uh, Jonah had sin in his life. There was corruption in Jonah. And he knew he could not stand before that wicked crowd and preach against sin because of that which was in his own heart. That's the reason many parents who find their kids on pot, their kids running around, they can't take a stand because they know their kids have seen things in their life. They can't stand up. I know preachers that can't stand up and thunder against sin because they took a look in their own heart and they melted like wax. Because there was a corruption inside their own heart. Do you know why you can't talk to your neighbors about sin? On the job, you can't stand up and announce and, and pronounce judgment against sin. Now you do it leveling it because you, but you can't do it because you've seen something in your own heart. You've seen the compromise and you can't do it. Jonah had sin in his life. Therefore, thou which teachest another, do you teach yourself? You that preach a man should not steal, do you steal? When you Preach that a man should not commit adultery. Have you been committing adultery? There have been times in my ministry, 
over past years that I could not thunder against sin because I looked inside and I saw something that grieved me. But one day when I saw his flaming eyes, I said, Lord, never again will I be uncomfortable around a man of God. Never again will I have a man who walks close to Jesus look me on, make me tremble. Never again, God helping me, will I ever have to sit in a house of God when the Lord's presence comes down mightily and feel uncomfortable and tremble because of sin. Never. Thank God he purged me, stripped away the dross and made me fit to come into his presence faultless and accepted in the beloved. But you see, when you've got sin in your life, you're going for a crisis. You're going for a submarine ride for sure. You'll go to the very gates of hell. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. And I tell you, he was not a captive of the devil. He was a captive of the Lord. It was as if the Lord had said to the devil, it's, he, he could say to the whole world, now it's my fish. This is my servant. You can give him a ride. You can take him down and give him a glimpse of hell, but you can't hurt him. And when he settled the sin question, you drop him off on the shores of obedience. He's my man. You can't touch him. I'm going to look you right in the eye and tell you that a person who is filled with the Holy Spirit and living in the heavenly seated with Christ Jesus cannot be touched by Satan. No way. He cannot be touched by the enemy. First of all, the reason I know that I can't be possessed by demons because the devil can't even find me because my life is hid in Christ Jesus. He can't even find me. Secondly, when God cursed the devil and the demons, he said, you shall eat of the dust of the earth. And my Bible said I was raised from the dust. No, no dust. You get dust in you, he'll come and eat it. You get the devil's ground, he can get you. Now, the devil can move around you in circumstance, uh, your circumstance. He'll give you a ride in the belly of a whale. But when you settle the sin question and you're ascended with Christ in heavenly places in Christ Jesus and you've accepted the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, you are absolutely immune from any possession of Satan because you are seated at the right hand of the Father hid in Christ Jesus and you can't tell me a demon can go with you. You can't cross the veil and have a demon follow you. I, I want no part of it. No part of it. I've seen the supremacy of the Lord Jesus Christ and the glory of a resurrected life at the right hand of the Father. In this crisis, Jonah looks at his heart and in the belly of the well he said, they that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. And suddenly he sees himself for what he really is. He said, I've been lying all the time. I've been lying about the pride that's in my heart. There's been deception in him. There were blind spots that had been unexposed up to this time. Up to this time, he'd been walking as the Gentiles in Ephesians, in the vanity of their own minds, having their understanding dark and alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that was in them because of the blindness of their own heart. And in the belly of the well, Jonah cries out, Forgive me, and he deals with the lying vanities in him. That was God at work. I, I told the conference the other night, I'd much rather fall in the hands of the devil than fall in the hands of an angry God. You see, the Lord told us to go into all the world and preach the gospel, and we looked inside our own hearts and we melted and we don't go because we can't look at the mirror. But it was by reason of Jonah's affliction he cried out to God and prayed and confessed and, confessed and was renewed. God's not going to turn you over to Satan. He'll not forsake you in your crisis. He'll allow the devil to take you in his submarine and show you a glimpse of hell. He'll let seaweed and dark water swirl around your head and God will allow a crisis to be created in your life so that just knowledge won't get you out. You have to have a revelation. You have to be honest before God. And when He reveals the ugliness in you and humbles and crushes you, then he reaches in and said, Satan, that's as far as you can go. Spit him out. Hallelujah. Now let me tell you, secondly, that it's in the presence of Christ that sin is exposed. As wax melts before the fire, 
So let the wicked perish at the presence of God. The enemy shall fall and perish at thy presence. The heart cry of mine, and I believe it should be the heart cry of every church that loves Christ, should be for a demonstration, a revelation of the awesome power of his presence. We should be praying that. Consider what happened to Peter when he got a demonstration, when Jesus committed himself to give him a revelation of his presence. Do you remember these words? Now, when he left speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draught. Now, remember this picture. Simon was there, probably touched him. Simon sat there. He pushed the boat out, and Simon was in the boat with him. And Simon sat there while for hours Christ talked the crowd. He'd spent a whole night after that trying to catch fish, and nothing came. Now, he'd seen Christ that day. He'd heard him and probably touched him. He's, he was within arm's length. He was in the presence of Christ, but he had no revelation of who he was. Christ had not committed himself to give Peter a revelation of his presence. Now, I want you to notice something now. Then Jesus said, I want you to cast out again and cast your nets on the other side. Because Christ was about to manifest himself to Peter. Listen to it. They enclosed then a great multitude of fishes, and their nets broke, and they beckoned unto their partners which were in the other ship, and they filled both ships so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, what? A manifestation of the presence of Christ. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I'm a sinful man, O Lord. What happens when Christ says, I'm going to commit myself to you? Do you remember the story in the Bible of, of the disciples that came to him? Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover and the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did, but Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men, he knew what was in them. He said, I will not commit my presence, I will not commit a revelation of my presence to those who follow me only for the fish and the loaves and the signs and the wonders in America. I will not manifest my presence to you. I will not commit myself to you. I know what's in you. You want me for what I give you. You don't want me for who I am. I will not manifest myself to you. I will not commit myself to you. There are many, many people that think they've been in the presence of the Lord. They come to a meeting and People are being healed. And they cry, we want to see the signs and the wonders and the miracles. And I believe in signs and wonders and miracles. I believe that that, that is just the automatic uh, result of a demonstration of the presence of Christ. First of all, people fall on their knees. Their sins are exposed. And those who need healing get healing without anybody touching them. It's simply because they're in the presence of the Lord. And he said, you people are... You, 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 you follow me for the miracles, but I'm not going to commit myself to you. And I, I, I go to many services where people claim so many, they, you know, they want to wave clutches around and, and, and say, look what we've seen. No, it's what we've experienced of him. The Christ has committed himself. We've had a manifestation of his presence. And I, I sit in the service and I hear a lot of noise. I hear people clapping, but I don't see or feel a maximum manifestation of the real presence of Jesus. He said, I'm not going to commit myself to you. But now here's Peter. Peter had been there all day. He hadn't seen or heard. He didn't hear. It was going in one ear and out the other. There was the very Son of God, but he didn't know who he was. His sins hadn't been exposed yet. You know Jesus had been teaching. Surely in that teaching of Christ, his sins would have been exposed. His sins were not exposed. He didn't see his own heart. And then suddenly the Lord looks at Peter and sees a hungry heart and he says, I'm going to show him who I am. I'm going to reveal myself to him. He says, Peter cast out. And when he sees that great thing, fear comes over him. And suddenly he goes to Christ and he falls before his knees and takes his feet and grabs and says, Oh, depart from me, son of God, I'm a wicked man. Why did Peter say that? Because he had a revelation of who Jesus was. He was in the actual presence of the Lord. The Holy Spirit revealing him. Hallelujah. Peter, James, and John and the sons of Zebedee were exposed in their sins. 
because they were witnessing a supernatural revelation, a demonstration of the presence of Christ. They weren't dancing. They weren't applauding or shouting or laughing. They were smitten for their sins. They were on their knees. They couldn't stand in His holy presence. You know what would happen here this morning if everybody in this house had spent time with God this morning or yesterday getting into His presence, honoring Him, focusing on Him, becoming detached from material things and focusing everything within us, all our energies on Jesus Christ and Him ascended. And we came into this place asking for Him to commit Himself to us. He won't commit Himself to harlots and prostitutes of the Spirit. I mentioned it the other night in the, the crusade that the, the sin of Sodom was that the woman was not needed. That spiritual sodomy, that spiritual homosexuality, the woman is the church. And many people don't need it. They're running all around. They say, I don't need the church. The body of Jesus Christ is, is the man. See, the lesbian in that city didn't need the man. That's Christ. Many people have a form of godliness, but they really don't know Him. They don't need the man. And then the real sin of Sodom was that the virgins were marrying homosexuals and not having intercourse because Lot had two virgin daughters, the Scripture says. And then when Lot fled, he called for sons-in-laws. So they were married. And they were not having intercourse. And that's a type of many people who go to church that they are spiritual sodomites because they have not had intimacy. They're married. Yes, they say I'm married to Christ, but they don't know Him. They've not touched Him. There's no intimacy with Him. Christ has not committed Himself to them yet because there is no desire to go all the way with Him. Please turn the tape over for the remaining part of this message. So we, I feel God's more concerned about the spiritual homosexuality, the spiritual sodomy, than the physical. And if we had come into this place this morning saying, Oh, Jesus, manifest your awesome presence. Not one of you could toy with the sin that He's told you to lay down. Not one of you could stand. You'd have your hand in your face saying, Oh, God, I see things that I didn't know were in me. Oh, God, there are lying vanities in me. There are things that you've been telling me to do. I've lost my burden for souls. I don't weep and cry for my unsaved anymore. I'm so attached to material things. I'm so attached to this world. I'm not what I used to be. How many of you could remain unbroken? It's not just a matter of being clear before the eyes of God. It's a matter of saying how short we've come of the glory of the Lord. We've fallen so short of His glory. Now, John the Revelator said there's a day coming when there's going to be a mighty manifestation of His presence. And I believe it's not far away. He said it's going to start with a great earthquake. The sun's going to become black as sackcloth. The moon won't be able to shine. It'll turn to blood. The stars are going to fall like figs shaking in the wind. The heavens are going to open like a scroll. Every mountain island is going to be moved out of its place. And there before the eyes of all mankind will be manifested Christ sitting on His throne. And the kings of the earth and the great men, the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men, every bondman, every free man hid themselves in the dens and the rocks of the mountains, they said to the rocks and mountains, Fall on us, hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Before that happens, the prophets, you see it in Isaiah, you see it in Paul, you see it in Malachi, all predicted that the Redeemer, Christ, is coming to his church, Zion, before he comes, and he's going to give the greatest commitment, uh, manifestation of his presence that Christ has ever given to the world. The Redeemer, Isaiah 59, 20, The Redeemer shall come to Zion, and unto them that turn from transgression. Paul said, There shall come out of Zion a deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob, and he shall take away their sins. But Malachi put it best. How succinctly he put it. And the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple. How many believe the word of God? And who? The Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple. Then who's going to abide the day of his coming? Who among you are going to be able to stand when he truly appears? Because he's coming like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. 
He shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi. That's the ministry first. He's going to purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. And I will come near to you in judgment. I prophesy, I tell you now in the name of the Lord with everything in me. I see it. I know it. He's going to come with a manifestation of his presence. There are going to be times that you come into the house of God and if you're willing to deal with your sin, he's going to manifest himself. You don't have to give an altar call when that happens because people are exposed and they run. They fall on their face before God because Christ is being manifested his awesome presence. And you see, when that happens, you're transformed. You're transformed by what you behold. You become what you look at. You become what you behold. But we all, with an open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of His presence. We're cheer we are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. You become what you behold. If you're looking at demons all the time, if you're looking at prosperity all the time, if you're looking at health and wealth all the time, you become what you behold. Why not look to Jesus and He alone because you're changed into His image by beholding His face. Hallelujah. Paul said, I've determined to know nothing among you. Nothing. I'm going to preach anything, he said, but Jesus Christ, Him crucified. I'm going to hold on to the head. I'm going to come into the fullness of Christ that we may all grow up in all things, which is the head, even Christ, that He may fill all things. Unto Him be glory in the church. That he may fill all things. That he may fill your life and your mind and your spirit. I've been beholding him. High and lifted up. How it's purged my heart. How it's opened his word to me. And I want to tell you what he's about to do. For he's about to raise up a new people. We're moving out of the Feast of Pentecost. Into the Feast of Tabernacles. And it just doesn't happen overnight. It's, it's, it's a kingdom that's changing. We are moving. You see, when you got saved, in the early, this was from Luther on, that was the outer court. Pentecost is the holy place. But now it's the Holy of Holies. And the Holy of Holies, what's there? The ark and the mercy seat. That's Christ on His throne. And he said, there are going to be a people in the last days that are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus who have become detached from the world, who have gone out to meet him. And the Lord is raising up a people, a body, right now all over the country. I'm meeting them. I'm discerning them. I see here and there, not many, but just a sprinkling of some of the God preachers and other preachers, Baptists. I met many of them in this Baptist or, or James Robinson Convention. Many. I discerned the body. Many, many men being awakened. Seek in the face of God, shut in with the Lord night and day, a revelation of who He is, a manifestation of His presence, sin being dealt with, a holy people in a dark age. He said, if you won't do it, I'll call my people by another name. He'll bypass you. You're going to be left with nothing but empty shadows and dreams. You'll come here, your choir will go through the motions, and then you're going to hear of a fire burning down here, a young man that's touched God. You'll see a people holy, sanctified, not caring about what kind of clothes people wear, not caring about how, what kind of job they have, but just loving Jesus, so possessed with Him, so obsessed with the vision of Jesus Christ, a people almost otherworldly, seeking Him, that have moved out, saying He's coming, the bridegroom's coming, go out to meet Him. The church is not ready, and the Lord's not going to come. He says He's not coming until, until what? Every enemy has made His footstool. He's not coming before you tell me all the signs that you want about the coming of Jesus. He's not coming till every enemy has made his footstool, until he has a race of men who bring down the strongholds of the enemy and bring Christ back in glory and power and authority. It never was God's plan for Christians to live in defeat and adultery and sin. He's, he was coming for an overcoming people, and he's getting it ready. For, we're moving into the Feast of the Tabernacles. We've been there three or four years now, and it's soon to break out in his glory, and I'm not going to miss it. I'm moving into the Holy of Holies, purged and sanctified by His Spirit. I'm going to close in a moment, but I had a tremendous experience once for about five hours being carried out in a stream of praise way out into the cosmos and past the stars racing toward the throne, the judgment seat. And in that 
black space racing closer and closer to the Lord in the judgment seat. I saw the earth becoming just a little speck in space. Just a tiny little speck and it was about to vanish. And the Bible said on the judgment day there'll be no place to stand. There's, there's no, nothing firm. You're suspended in His grace. There's nothing left. The only thing you're going to have when He takes you toward the judgment seat is the knowledge of Christ. The fullness of Himself. And if you don't have that, you have nothing. And I looked at that little pin in space. It was about to vanish. A little light, pin of light. It was about to just go black. I remember in my subconscious mind screaming, Oh God, that was my whole world. My ministry's gone. The family, the house, the car, everything's gone. It's all going to be gone. There's nothing left. I said, Oh God, my whole world, everything I held dear is gone. And now I've got to face you. And at first there was a moment of fear. And then I remembered the judgment seat of Christ for the overcomers is when you're finally getting the kiss on the cheek. That he's going to present you faultless and that the judgment seat you don't have to fear if you've been in the Feast of Tabernacles, if you've been in the holy place. That's just the moment he comes in and say, well done. And he puts his arm around you spotless, without fault, with exceeding great joy. And you stand outside the judgment seat and then when you're ushered into His presence, He stands and says, My beloved, my beloved, puts His arms around you and what a rejoice. When I went into His presence, I, I heard the singing of all the angels. I heard seraphims. I heard choirs. So, someone said they had a vision of heaven. Gold streets, gold flowers, everything. I said, How boring. How boring. I don't want to go to an all gold city. Oh no, if it's more than that, he's saying something about purity and holiness. I don't need. There's no such thing as as actual physical gold streets. I don't want to walk on any gold streets because when I was in his presence, I didn't see his face, but I I was on my face. I passed out in the pulpit for half an hour while the Lord took me into the heavens in his presence. I didn't want to see my wife or family. I didn't want to see my godly father who passed on. I didn't want to see. Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob. I didn't want to see anybody. I didn't want to see streets of gold. I didn't want to see mansions. I, I wanted to touch Him. His presence was so full. He said, my right hand are pleasures and glory forevermore. And my consciousness, I realized in eternity we're going to have an expanded consciousness that all through eternity we're going to learn more and more of His grace and the ecstasy is going to grow and grow and of His kingdom and knowledge there is no end. And all through eternity, He's going to tell us of His glory. He's going to expand our consciousness. And the glory and the joy and the ecstasy will grow and grow and grow. It's not level. It's not static. It's ever expanding. It was so full, I really believed that if I had stayed there, if the Lord had let me just go another five minutes, I would have never come back. I didn't want to come back. It was terrible to wake up and be here on earth. But then I realized that I'm already there. You, you wait for your heaven. I've got my heaven right now. I'm in the right hand of God seated in Christ Jesus. I've taken my position by faith. I don't live with bondage or fear. I don't permit the devil to take dominion anymore because I know who I am in Christ Jesus seated in heavenly place. Now before I close, I'm going to ask him to do what he said he would. To just come. In a simple manifestation of His presence. It's not... It, I could say, how many of you believe Jesus is here and you could raise your hand, but that doesn't produce it. That doesn't mean He's here. He's here because people want to deal with their sin. It was said to Nathaniel, the only disciple it was said to, Behold an Israelite in whom there's no guile or sin. Behold, you'll have an open heaven. And I want to tell you something. The moment you get honest and lay down your sin and your pride, the heavens open to you. You'll see Christ like you've never seen Him. You'll see a manifestation of His presence. People will see it in you. They'll know it. They'll touch it. You'll be a re you won't have to even witness at the job. You'll be a reproach because Christ will be so powerful. In you. You'll be a, pro a reproach to everybody around you. It'll emanate from you. And when people need, they'll come to you. They'll be attracted because of the presence of Christ in you. In you. People who are living in sin will want to move away. Don't move to the next pew because there's something about you. You have an open heaven. 
you've had a commitment of His presence in your life. Aren't you hungry? We're going to deal with sin. We're going to ask God to place you before the judgment seat right now because that's where He is. That's where we are. We're His judgment seat. I'm not going to ask you to tell me what it is. You've been sitting here, said Brother Wilkerson. <sighs> oh, how far I've gone from what you're talking about. They call me a prophet. I'm not, but I do prophesy. And I'm prophesying right now. God sent me here to tell you this church can miss it. And if you miss it, you're going to miss it in the next few weeks. There should be people Sunday night coming in here on their knees up here seeking God before the service so that there's, a, there's an atmosphere created in this place. There ought to be people calling on God like never before, humbling themselves, dealing with sin, saying, Lord, I want that open heaven. I, I want my family saved before he comes. Hallelujah. Jesus. 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 Manifest your presence. There are going to be people all over this building suddenly sense your presence. Lord, not everybody's going to sense it, but some are. You're, you're committing yourself to individuals right now, your presence. There's some young people now that have been mocking you long enough, playing and flirting with their sin. There are people here, Lord, Christians that have been walking with you for years, Lord, that are not dealing with that thing in their heart that you put your finger on. And the Lord said, now is the time. I've dealt with you long enough. I'm going to come to you this morning, give you a sense of my presence, convict you once more. Come all the way or none at all. If I'm not Lord of all, I can't be Lord at all. Jesus, be Lord now. Speak to us about the sin in our lives. If you feel Holy Spirit searching you, you see His flaming eyes. And you feel His presence this morning. You say, David, I want Him to break me and melt me and take it all. You want to lay it down, get up and just come up here and stand, bow in His presence and say, Jesus, here it is. I'm not going to stick a microphone under your face. I'm not going to touch you. I'm not going to be near you. I just want you to get it out so we can get an open heaven.